You guys have a, an exam on chapter two, um, the end of the chapter exam on my math lab this weekend. You have a few days to take it. You have a couple of tries. Um, you only have an hour and 15 minutes and you wanna make sure that you're being aware of the time while you're doing it. I would suggest that maybe you take it once and then look at it and study up on where you are feeling weak and retake it again. You are gonna be submitting the written work to the camp assignment that is, is posted for that. And that needs to, you're only submitting the work for the test that has the best score. So let's look at some circles for a second. So circles was part of this chapter. So you should be able to find an equation of a circle given information. So for instance, if we were given that HK is equal to negative three, two, and R is equal to two root five. So write the standard form of the equation and the general form of each equation um, of each circle with of radius R and center HK and then graph it. Okay, so here, standard form of a circle you should know what that is. That's x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared is equal to r squared. So the information we're given, we know what h is. h is negative 3. We know what k is. k is 2. And we're given what r is. r is 2 root 5. And so let's just go in there and plug in those values. So we have x minus a negative three, quantity squared, plus y minus our two, quantity squared, is equal to r, which is two root five, that quantity is squared. So let's rewrite the first one, x minus a negative three. That's the same thing as x plus three, quantity squared plus y minus two, quantity squared equals. So using rules of exponents, I can raise each piece because it's strictly multiplication in there. I can square each piece. So if I square my two, I get back four. And if I square my square root of five, I just get back five. And so now we have the standard form of the circle, x plus three quantity squared plus y minus two quantity squared is equal to 20. And wanted us to also put this in general form. Before I do that, I also want you to be able to find your intercepts if they exist. So let's do that too while we're here. So let's find x and y intercepts. If they exist. Well, a couple of things that we can do, we could plot this and we can kind of look in and see if it's going to cross the X and Y axis. And if so, about how many times? If we look at our graph, we have a center at negative three when X is negative three, Y is two. Our radius is the square root of 20 or two root five. And so I know that that's between four and five, and I'm just going to estimate going up. Let's just plug that in and see about what it is. It's probably around 4.5, but let me just look on the calculator real quick. Yeah, so our radius is about 4.5. So if I think about it from going up from positive two to 4.5, that's about 6.5. If I go down about 4.5 from two, 
That's negative 2.5 about. If I go to the left, 4.5 from negative three, that's about negative 7.5. And if I go to the right from negative three, 4.5, that would get me up to 1.5. And so I notice that this is gonna be crossing both the X and the Y axis, and it's gonna be crossing them twice. And pretend that that's a circle. So to find our X intercept, we're gonna let y equal zero. And so if we do that, we get this x plus three, quantity squared plus zero minus two. So negative two quantity squared equals 20. So we have x plus three quantity squared, negative two quantity squared is four equals 20. Let's isolate this perfect square and use the square root method. So let's subtract four on both sides, we get 16. Using the square root method. So this is a perfect problem because this was information that we had done in the first chapter. And so it's retesting you on what we've done before. So we have x plus three is equal to plus or minus root 16. So x plus three, equals positive four and x plus three equals negative four. Solve for x, we get x equals one and we got x equals negative seven. So now let's find the y-intercept. This is the case where we let x equals zero. So if we go in here now and we plug in zero for x and not for y, we would have zero plus three, so three squared, plus y minus two, quantity squared equals 20. So again, let's use that square root method. So let's first isolate the perfect square. Three squared is nine. And I'm gonna be subtracting nine on both sides of my equation. And so I have y minus two quantity squared is equal to 20 minus nine. So that's 11. So taking the square root of both sides, I get y minus two equals plus or minus the square root of 11. So adding two to both sides, I get two plus or minus root 11. So if I was to write that as a point, we have an exact value, two plus root 11, zero, and two minus root 11, comma, zero. So our intercepts we found, Last piece, it wanted this in general form. I left it in standard form to find the intercepts. I think that's the easiest way, but general form, let me write that out, of a circle is gonna be the following. So the coefficient in front of your x squared term and your y squared term is one. And if it's not one, you're gonna to have to make it one. So it's x squared plus y squared plus some coefficient in front of our x, so plus ax, plus some coefficient in front of our y, so plus by, plus so some constant c is equal to zero. So let's go in, we're basically gonna just expand that standard form of our circle that we found. So we have x plus three quantity squared plus y minus two quantity squared is equal to 20.
Okay, so we cannot just square each term because we have a sum in between those, sum in between the terms. And so we want x plus three times x plus three plus y minus two times y minus two. This was set equal to zero. So let's subtract 20 on both sides. So minus 20 equals zero. If we expand out x plus three times x plus three, combining like terms, that trinomial is gonna be x squared plus six x plus nine. Plus if we expand it out y minus two times y minus two and combine like terms, you're gonna get back y squared minus four y plus four. Let's bring down the minus 20 equals zero. So let's just combine like terms. So the only like terms that we have in there are the constants. So I'm gonna bring in down all the terms that don't have the constant yet. So x squared plus six x plus y squared minus four y. And then adding nine plus four is 13 and 13 minus 20, that gives me negative seven is equal to zero. So we found the general form of that circle. So the other thing that you're gonna to need to be able to do is given a circle in general form, you're gonna to need to put it in standard form so that you can figure out what the center of the circle is, what the radius is, and then can answer more questions. Like where does it cross the x or y axis? if it does. So let's look at one. So how about 2x squared plus 2y squared minus 12x plus 8y minus 24 equals zero. So I'm gonna to wanna to complete the square on my x terms and my y terms. Normally we group our X terms and our Y terms together. The problem with completing the square right now is that we don't have a coefficient of one in front of that X squared and the Y squared term. But notice that they're the same number and that's always gonna be the same. Um, that's always gonna be the case if they're circles. And we'll talk about that more at the end of the class when we get into ellipses and hyperbolas. But notice that because this is an equation, we can divide everything by that two divide both sides by two, and then we'd have to distribute. Or multiply both sides by one half. We'd have to distribute. So if I divide every single term by two, we get x squared. I'm gonna rewrite this so that my x terms are next to each other. So minus 12x over two is really minus six x. So remember we're adding something in here to make this a perfect square. So we're just gonna put a spot there that I'm gonna add something. Plus, so I'm gonna group my y terms together. Two y squared over two is y squared, plus eight y over two is four y, plus we're gonna add something here to make this a perfect square, is equal to, so recall we always wanna get everything to one side or the constant to the other side of the equation. So this is on this side, we have a minus 12 in here. So to move that to the other side, we're gonna add 12 to both sides. And zero divided by two is zero. So zero plus 12 is 12. We were adding a couple things on the other side. So we have to also add them on this side of the equation. Okay, so now we can complete the square on our X terms and we can complete the square on our Y terms. Completing the square, once we have that coefficient in front of the square of one, which we do, we look at half of the middle term. So half of negative six, coefficient of the middle term, half of negative six is negative three. So we know negative three plus negative three gives us the negative six. We want the constant of that trinomial to be negative three times negative three, which would be nine. So that would make that a perfect square now because minus three times minus three 
gives us the minus six and negative three times negative three gives us the positive nine. So this could be X minus three quantity squared. Plus, so we're doing the same thing with our Y terms. We wanna complete the square on Y squared plus four Y. So we have to look at half of the coefficient in front of Y. So half of four is two. So I know two plus two is four. And that last term has to be two times two and two times two is four. So we're gonna add four to those sides. And that same number you're gonna to add to get four and multiply to get four was that plus two. So that perfect square is y plus two quantity squared. This is equal to, well, 12 plus nine, that's 21. And 21 plus that four gives us 25. So now it's in the standard form and we know what the circle will look like. We know what the center is. Oops, so the center opposite signs. So H is gonna be positive three and K is gonna be negative two. So center at three, negative two. Recall that this is equal to R squared so 25 is R squared. Radius is a distance, so it has to be positive. So R is five. So that's circles and things that you should know about that. It's possible that maybe you're given two points um, that is, on the diameter. If you were given two points on the diameter of a circle, we could figure out what the radius is. We could figure out the radius by taking, finding the distance between the two points. So that's something that we had done in this chapter. Once we have that distance, that uh, length of the diameter, we know that the radius is half of that. So we could take half of that value and we could also find the center. The center is the midpoint between the diameter. And that was another piece in this, this chapter that we had to do. So that would be a problem that kind of tests you multiple areas from this, this chapter. So that could be a good problem too. But we only have about 14 more minutes of class. So I wanna jump in now to variations because you guys had some questions about and wanted to go over some of those variation problems. So let me pull some of those up for you. Okay, so here is a variation application problem. So with these problems, there's really three things that you're doing. You're setting up your generic equation. These varies directly, varies inversely, varies jointly, varies proportionally, varies, um, et cetera. These always have some constant K in here that we're trying to find. And so they're gonna give us enough information to set this up um, generically. And then they're gonna give us enough information that we can figure out what that constant K is so that we have that equation that answer any question that they throw at us. And so let's first read through it and then let's set up that general equation. Then we'll find K and then we'll answer the question they want. So it problem says that at the corner shell station, the revenue R varies directly with the number G of gallons of gasoline sold. If the revenue is $34.08 when the number of gallons is 12, find the linear equation that relates the revenue R to the general number G of gallons of gasoline sold. And then find the revenue when the number of gallons of gasoline sold is 10.5. Okay, so here is where they give us how to set up our equation. R varies directly. If they don't, and that's the revenue. So if they just said the revenue varies directly, you're gonna to have to come up with a variable that represents this. They give us though, so in this case, R. So whenever we get that, we get R varies directly or proportionally or jointly. You always have R equals, we're always gonna have that constant K in here. So I'll always just put it there 
and then continue to read on. So it varies, R varies directly with the number G of gallons of gasoline sold. So R equals K times G. This is our general formula. But now we have enough information they're gonna give us so that we can figure out what K is. And so in here, it tells me that if the revenue is $34.08, then we're given that the number of gallons sold, G, is equal to 12. So we're gonna go in, plug that into our equation. So we know our revenue is 34.08 is equal to that constant K times G. And we're given that G is 12 here. So let's divide both sides by 12. So we get K is equal to 34.08 divided by 12. If this rounds, then don't, don't round it. To, um, that can cause an error unless you, it's at, at the end. So this gives me K is 2.84. So let's go in. And now we have the equation where we can answer the question that they're throwing at us. So we're just gonna go back in and plug in what K is. So we know that the revenue of the cost of gas, filling up your tank is gonna be $2.84 times the number of gallons you purchase. So now we can use this equation to figure out, they want us to find the revenue when the number of gallons of gas sold is $10 or 10.5 gallons. So we know what G is, G in this case is 10.5. So we have R is equal to 2.84 all times 10.5. Throw that in the calculator. And we get that this is equal to, the revenue is equal to $29.82. It would be nice if gas got down to that price again. It would save us probably a lot of money. Okay, so that's how that one is set up. I think we have time to do one more. So the next example in front of us states that the force exerted by the wind on a plane surface varies directly with the area of the surface and the square of the velocity of the wind. If the force on an area is 20 square feet is 11 pounds, when the wind velocity is 22 miles per hour, find the force on the surface area of 47.125 square feet when the wind velocity is 36.5 miles per hour. Okay, they didn't give us our variables, but we can define what our variables are. So it says the force exerted um, by the wind on a plane surface. Okay, so force, maybe let F equal the force on the plane surface. So this varies directly. So we know now F is equal to some K, and then it varies directly with the area of the surface. So 
So maybe A equals the area of the surface. Um, so directly with the area of the surface, sur surface, so times A, and the square of the velocity of the wind. So let V equal the velocity. So all times V squared. So we now have our general equation. We're gonna go and use the information that they gave us to figure out what K is. So if the force, we got the force, on the area of 20 square feet. So this is the area. So A equals 20 square feet is 11 pounds. So we're given that the force is 11 pounds when the velocity, so this is our V value, when velocity is 22 miles per hour. So V in this case is 22 miles per hour. So now we have what the variables represent. If we plug that in, we'll be left with an equation with just the variable K and we can solve for that. So we got our force, which is 11, equals K all times our area. Our area is 20 times our velocity squared, and our velocity is 22. So 22 squared. So if I square 22, I get 484. Actually, let's do it this way. Just, um, I noticed that 11 goes into 22 evenly. So let's actually do it this way. I'm gonna write this as, how about 20, before we multiply it out, times 22 times 22. So to get K by itself, we would be dividing by that 20 times 22 times 22. And so we would get here, this is equal to 11 all over 20 times 22 times 22. So 11 goes into itself once and 11 goes into 22 two times. So I have one all over, well two times 20 is 40 and then I have 40 times 22, which is 880. So we know what K is, and we can answer our question. So our formula that we are going to be using now is the force is equal to 1 over 880 all times the area of the surface times the velocity squared. So now we can answer our question and it wants us to find the force when we're trying to find F of the surface area of 47. Surface area, so A is equal to 47.125 square feet. And the wind velocity, so velocity is equal to 36.5 miles per hour. Yeah. All right. And so now we can plug those things in. So we're looking for our force is equal to one over 880 times our area. 47.125, all times are 36.5 quantity squared.
order of operations, you're going to square your 36.5 first. Once you get that result, you're going to multiply it by 47.125. We're going to take that result and we're going to divide by 880. And it doesn't tell me what I want to round to. So this is approximately 71.5. Three, four, four um, pounds, or in terms of pounds. So we're able to answer the question with what it's given us. So just take it slow. I know that a lot of times students will look and see that it's a word problem and their mind just shuts down. Don't do that. That doesn't give you any points. Um, so just kind of quick, you go through and just nitpick it. And it could be something that you just don't even really understand. But if you know the terminology and how to set it up and you know how to evaluate and solve for a variable, you got this. Okay, so we are done for today. Um, I will stick around. I have student hours if you need any help. If not, you have that test on my math lab this weekend. Make sure you get it in. This is one assignment that you can't get in and do late.